We're Tony and Chelsea Northup. This is the Picture This podcast, an audio format that we do that you can listen to in any of your podcasting apps or watch on YouTube. Great while you're washing the dishes or driving to work or exercising or whatever it is you do. That's the best example you could come up with. Sure. This covers it all. Today, our topic is seven mistakes that photographers make based on our experience working with just thousands of photographers in different stages of the careers, the types of things we see people doing wrong over and over again. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible, Audible <laughs> is a leading provider of premium digital spoken audio information. That means audiobooks, people. And you can get a free audiobook by going to audible.com slash photo and sign up. You get your free 30 day trial and that comes with a free book. Thanks for sponsoring us, Audible. We'll talk about Audible a little bit more in just a minute. Just uh, you thought the, the biggest mistake people make is just being a loner. Well, I didn't think this list was in any order. I'm oh, not going to say that's a huge mistake. List should always be in order. I don't know. I don't ascribe to that philosophy, so I'm just okay. gonna. But I do think that being a loner is a big mistake that some photographers make, and this is something I've learned along my career. I'm not necessarily saying Tony and I haven't made any of these mistakes; these are just ones we've observed. Um, like people just think that they can work completely alone. That being a photographer means just going out there and taking pictures and somehow becoming a better photographer in a vacuum without any input. Um, but what I've learned over the years that I've been a photographer is that so many photographers, the great ones are really smart about utilizing photography groups, whether that be an in-person club or a group online. Um, and some of the greatest photographers, Ansel Adams, for example, started their own. He started group F64. Maybe you heard of it. Yeah, I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> and they work together to uh, do gallery exhibits and also just start a new type of photography they had kind of a manifesto of ideas that they shot they th thought should apply to photography. Um, and I think a big way to avoid this type of mistake is just to find any way to connect with different people. If you're comfortable being online, then hang out in forums, uh, lots of Facebook groups, including our own stunning digital photography Facebook group. Uh, connect with photo walks, take workshops, take classes. I really figured this out when I started taking classes in the Boston area and working with other photographers in different learning stages. And I'd, I'd go out with a group of people. And I, at the time, I felt pretty confident about my skills. But you'd go out with other people, maybe even less experienced people. And at the end of the day, somebody else would end up with the better picture. They'd have seen an angle or found a moment that I just missed. And that's not something that should make you feel bad. That's a learning moment. You can say to yourself, they we were in the same spot at the same time I had that chance. They did a little bit better. What can I do next time? Maybe it's even just a gear thing. Maybe even to see, oh, somebody's got this latch or tripod or something, and I can pick that up. And I know when we started shooting with Samantha Shannon, she always had uh, all of these ideas for us, different gear to try or different techniques that she had tried. And so you can just be inspired by other photographers or just get support from them. They generally tend to be a really supportive group. Or they can be your muse, uh, like George O'Keefe and Steiglitz. I always mispronounce all the foreign names. I apologize. But O'Keefe was his muse. So he would take thousands of pictures of her. And uh, not only did they support each other as artists, he supported her art. She supported his. She actually curated a bunch of pictures of his and got them into the National Gallery after he had, he had died. Um, but they also just, as artists, they worked well together. They inspired one another. They supported one another. So do not be an island. Do not feel like if you're doing it alone, you're somehow better. And know that it's a community. Ask for help. Give help. And be inspired by each other. Refusing to change. We have like 25,000 people in our photography group on Facebook. Yeah. And one thing that I've seen is the people that take feedback really well and actually use it and change, those people make the most growth. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I think Sorry. it applies to like a bigger mindset too. If you're willing to change in that way, you're also willing to, let's say you started shooting on film, can you make the change and be a, the type of person that learns what hashtags are and posts on Instagram? I was really blown away recently. I had the opportunity to meet um, Ira Block, who is a National Geographic photographer. He's been in the game for a long time. 
He's highly respected. He's incredibly talented. He's been all over the world shooting for Nat Geo. And uh, he was showing me his Instagram. And, like 350,000 subscribers, yeah. something like that. Yeah, but he he was just on it. He didn't say, oh, I shot film, so now I won't do digital. He was showing off his Sony camera, and he was showing me how he posts to Instagram and stuff, and I was really inspired by him. In In, so including many. using his smartphone some. Yeah. He's not above that, even though he's a very famous National Geographic photographer. Well, yeah, he's in, in interacting with the social media. I hope you don't mind me putting that information out there, Ira, but I was very inspired by that, that he was so fluid and changed even though he had already had some previous success he wasn't clinging to his old method necessarily on the other hand we talk to photographers all the time especially the people who've been at it a long time and they're like i'm not going to get on instagram it's nothing but teenagers taking pictures of their food and selfies yeah it's like that's not true there's pulitzer prize winning photographers on there like brian smith and National Geographic photographers, and they're doing fantastic work, as well as up-and-coming teenagers, by the way, taking pictures with their smartphones that are probably blowing away a lot of more experienced photographers' work. But there are so many other ways that you can embrace change to better yourself as a photographer. Like Arnold Newman, for example, he used to take 49-cent studio portraits. That's how Arnold Newman started. And then he kind of forefronted um, environmental portraits. So that wasn't really popular until he came along and he would take his camera out and his lighting gear and he would go to where the people were so that he could get a portrait of them in their natural environment. So uh, there's the picture of Stravinsky at a piano. That wasn't actually his piano, but it was an environment that showed, you know, what his career was and um, it better showed his personality. So Change doesn't necessarily just mean keeping up with the trends or uh, learning a new skill, but being willing to try something new, even if it's a little bit out of the box. Yeah, good point. I see this a lot with drone photography. A lot of photographers now are shying away from drones, even though it's this new tool that allows you to get a, a great yeah. aerial perspective. Like why People would, are snobby about yeah, it. Yeah, like they'll say, oh, well, that's not really photography, but it's just... A new style it's just something new to try yeah. I think sometimes people feel like they haven't tried it yet and they're gonna be left out if it becomes popular so they try to shun it like they're gonna stop it or something or they're gonna slow progress you're not gonna stop change by being stubborn or by judging other people just sometimes you have to embrace things number three is making excuses oh my gosh all the time if right? you can imagine as educators we have heard every excuse in the book. And if you've taken any kind of class, I'm sure you've heard other students' excuses. Yeah, the biggest one I hear is, oh, I only have my smartphone. That's the biggest one you hear? Probably so, from people who haven't yet gotten a real camera and think they, they, oh, they like photography, but they only have a smartphone and they getting a big camera seems like this big ponderous thing. Uh, just start with your smartphone. I hear, can I just go through a list? Well, I would have been a photographer, but I didn't have the money to do that, or I didn't have the time, or I, I got my degree in something else, or I had kids, or I didn't live in a city, so I didn't have access to fashion, or I couldn't afford the gear, or you can hear excuses for anything. People can make excuses for anything, but I mean, if you're going to do something, you just have to go for it, no matter what your circumstance. Andy Warhol used a Polaroid camera to get really famous portraits. Yep. And Sally Mann, she didn't live near a city. She just took pictures of her family and her kids. So she didn't need expensive models or fancy outfits or a fancy camera or to be in the right location. She just documented something that she was passionate about. And... Just on a personal note, I have a friend who's severely vision impaired and he runs a popular photography blog and is a great photographer. He goes out and shoots all of the time and he never makes excuses about it. So I think Jerry Johnson, the first time I talked to him, uh, he contacted me because he was trying to figure out how to work a camera because he was a paraplegic. Yeah. Yeah. And he had a little he, he used one of those mouth sticks. And he wanted to know, like, could I recommend a camera that was a little bit easier to interact with than whatever he was working with? Think of Jerry. Keep shooting, keep learning, and stop making excuses. Just shoot. Yeah. Let's talk about Audible. Uh, they, audible.com slash 
Photo will get you a 30-day free trial where you can track out a free audiobook, and you might even want to continue the subscription so you can continue to get free audiobooks that you can listen to anywhere on the go. Uh, you've been reading a, or listening to an audiobook lately, right, Charles? Yeah, what are you listening another to? Murakami book. Yeah, we both read the previous Murakami book. Haruki Murakami, we read... Um, what was the name of the Kafka book? on the Shore. Yeah. And I think we'd His titles are extremely complex. Yeah. I think we'd recommended that one before. And now I'm starting Hard Boiled Wonderland at the End of the World. And oh, I love his books. It's so, They're so surreal. It's like you're in a dream state. So, so far, my character is doesn't know what building he's in. It's completely white. There's no sound. And he's learned that the, one of the people in the building can turn off sound. It's completely surreal. I still don't really know what's going on. And that's what I love about his books is that you just can't stop reading because you need to know what's going to happen next. You need to figure out what's going on, if it's real, if it's a dream. He's amazing. I recommend you try Murakami. Get one of his books. I listen to... This is so nerdy. And speaking of nerdy, I got to say, if you're looking at a screenshot, you're going to see um, me using Microsoft Edge. That's only because I have the slideshow going in Chrome. I don't want people to be like, why are you using Internet Explorer? You don't want them ju judging no. you? No, I'm a Chrome guy. Anyway, uh, I read and listened to Ready Player One. And I say I read and listened to because I used the Kindle Whisper Sync thing. Yeah. Where you can get the audiobook and read it on your phone. And then if, if you're someplace, maybe you're driving to work, maybe you're running, uh, you can put your headphones in and pick right up where you left off with the audiobook. And then... You get back, I don't know, maybe you just have three minutes while you're waiting in line at the ATM. You can pull out your smartphone and read the ebook and keep going. That's what I like that feature too because I like to read when I'm going to bed or if I have the time to sit down and read, I like to read. But a lot of the time I don't have time and if I'm driving, I'll just listen to it or if I'm cleaning, I'll listen to it. So, whisper sync. It's another one of those don't make excuses. So many people are like, oh, I don't have time to read. But audiobooks and ebooks give you the opportunity to find time to read because you can fit it into your day. Wow, we're anyway, really hard on people today. Stop, stop making excuses. <laughs> anyway, Ready Player One by Ernest Cline is a, a book that I loved. I uh, Justin's been reading it too. I know it's, it's this takes place in a dystopian future. I love that stuff. <laughs> but if if you're a little bit nerdy, if you have some appreciation, especially for '80s video games, things like Galaga and Qbert. You're really gonna like it. I don't want to give too much away, but <laughs> it's so nerdy. But it's such a good book. They're making a movie out of it now. It's that good. They're making like a full-blown Hollywood production out of it. Wait, just Kubrick though. K Kubrick? Stanley Kubrick? Kubert. Wait, is it Kubert? Kubert is a video game. Kubrick was oh. a very famous director. Do you not know Kubert? Is this no, one of those I thought, age different? I thought problems? you were talking about like I thought you were talking about like futuristic movies, and I thought you you combined Dilbert and Kubrick, and I was like, this guy is so confused. There, there is no proper way for me to explain what Kubert is. It was a ridiculous game. Anyway, if you want to check out these audiobooks or others, go to Audible.com slash photo and get your 30-day free trial. Thank you for sponsoring us. Can I just Ottawa. say, like, people always kind of bust on us for mispronouncing something. I don't know what it is about being on air, but your brain, like, goes to mush for some reason. Does that happen to you? Well, you are thinking about a lot of other things, but also everybody mispronounces things throughout the course of the day. But, you know, you don't have 20,000 people listening to that particular word and then getting the opportunity to comment on it because it would be it would be rude but for some reason on the internet man i'm never gonna people get, love having that thing on you i'm never gonna give up the image of cubert in my mind which is dilbert but in a kubrick film <laughs> yeah people are gonna bust on you for that <laughs> sorry guys another mistake photographers make is ignoring history and i think mm. art studies right yeah because um, you can learn so much by studying other people's art. And I also think that you have to put your own creativity in context. So you're not creating art in a vacuum. You don't put a picture out there and then it's not within the context of every other picture ever taken, right? Right. So you have to understand the context that your photography is in. Um, to give your art its own purpose, you have to understand the greater purpose of art, how it's influenced history, um, and why it's so important in our culture 
You know, it expresses an idea. I think it tells the truth. I think it unifies people. So you have to get out there and you have to learn the stories. You have to learn about the greats and what made them great at the time. It can be difficult if you don't know the history of a particular artist to appreciate their art, especially if it happened a long time ago. Um, and from learning those things, you can understand yourself and your own art and what would make it better. And I'll take it a step further. A lot of photographers don't think they need to go into art museums and art galleries. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to visit all sorts of art galleries, whether it's sculptures or uh, classic like Renaissance style oil paintings. Not my favorite, but I, I like modern art. Um, but nonetheless, all these styles of art have a lot to teach you because they are 90% the same as photography. Yeah. <laughs> so many photographers get hung up on the f-stop and the shutter speed and the megapixels and the camera gear and stuff, but it's 90% the same as a, a landscape painter. Yeah. Because you're trying to capture the light and the mood and the location and the story. Same thing between portrait photography and painting a portrait. They're mostly the same. The difference is the medium. And you really should be studying art. You should be able to walk through a gallery and get, be able to understand most of it, yeah, at least yeah. some large portion of it. Don't be the guy who walks through and be like, oh, I could do that. Oh, man. Because yeah. you're missing something. You're missing something. If, if something's in an art museum and you look at it and you think it's stupid, you're just missing something. Yeah, just take the time and try to figure it out. Maybe mm -hmm. get a tour guide to walk you through and explain these things. Or take an art history class at your yeah. local community center or just get an art history book. Or you can even just listen to our podcast because, you know, we talk about the history of a lot of great photographers for that reason. That's why we started this podcast. Yeah, and actually YouTube has a lot of good art history videos mm -hmm. that I watch and, and try to understand this stuff better. It's certainly an area that I need to improve on myself. Uh, another mistake I think photographers make is they don't share their stuff enough. So many photographers are just so shy. Uh, I can't tell you how many times somebody has seen us in the street and come up and said, hi, oh, I watch your videos and, and we'll say, oh, where can I see your work? And they're like, oh, I don't share anything. Yeah. And um, I, I, I see different reasons that this happens. Sometimes they're insecure. They're afraid they're going to put it out there and then people are going to be mean to them. Which is, it's probably true. People, but most, for the most part, Facebook, Instagram are mostly supportive environments. They're not mean like YouTube. Well, that's why it's also important to be a part of a group like we were talking about. Like, yeah. you know, you can go join a photography club or take a photography class. Those are usually supportive people, artistic people. Uh, yeah, and I think that's a really Im important part of the process is actually sharing your work, even if you just make a print and put it on your own wall. At least then you're sharing it, you're looking at it, and other people will see it. Most of what you'll hear will be praise. People will see the picture and they'll be like, wow, that's a fantastic picture. Yeah. And that's gonna encourage you to keep going and to shoot some more. That, that kind of feedback is important. Another reason people don't share is they're a little paranoid. <laughs> Like they, they're going to oh, put their yeah. picture online and then somebody's going to be like, oh my God, this is the greatest cat picture ever. I'm going to take this Break and I'm going to put it everywhere. And then of course the photographer loses millions of dollars because somebody stole their cat picture. Like they imagine this whole scenario. Day. That happens every day. We discussed this some, we had a podcast on should you watermark and we kind of dig into the same topic some, but please don't let fear of your pictures being stolen prevent you from sharing stuff. Just don't let fear in general prevent you from doing anything artistic. Yeah. Um, a lot of people also, they want to like make sure that it's perfect before they share it. They just want to get a little bit better. But you should start as a rank amateur. God knows most of us start as rank amateurs and we're putting up very mediocre work in the beginning because that's, that's the process. But overall, people understand you start someplace and then you keep getting better and better. I Nobody's the best at photography. Nobody's well, perfect at it. You know, it. think of how we we always praise someone that's just kind of like a breakout star, right? Oh, wow. He put a, his first painting in a gallery and it sold for a million. Like, that's always a very exciting story. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we forget to praise the person that tried 1,000 times and it took 1,001 times to get it right. Like Thomas Edison with his little light bulb. Remember that guy? It's okay. You're not going to get it right the first time. You're probably going to really stink for a long time. But well, if you can stick it out, then one day you'll be good. Yeah. What would you tell your four-year-old if, if they were going to draw something 
Would you would be like, oh, that's not very good yet. Don't don't show anybody. Is that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Mommy's not putting this on the refrigerator. You haven't worked hard enough yet. <laughs> I find a lot of photographers also they they get to the point where they're uncomfortable with part of the photographic process and then they decide they're just never going to do that. So some people are love photography, but they're not great at computers. So suddenly they decide that I just don't do post processing. Um, oh yeah. Some people like photography, but then they maybe they think about getting a flash or they start working in strobes or reflectors or something and I don't know. Maybe this it feels too complex to them and so they don't get it. And then suddenly they become a natural life photographer. And I think it's totally cool to be a natural light photographer or to not do post-processing. But I, I think people should only do that once they've gotten some level of mastery with those things. So get into ph Photoshop and then decide you're not going to do it anymore. But don't do it because you just don't have those skills. So, so I think that's an important distinction to make. Some people self-limit to become more creative. Like I've known people that have only shot at 50 millimeter for a while just to force themselves to think differently, or they'll only do black and white for a while to force themselves to do creative something creatively, but they don't just rule something out because they're nervous about it or they feel like maybe they're not good at it or they haven't tried it before. And that's the distinction that we have to make. I'll make a practical case for it. If you're a natural light photographer and you haven't mastered uh, working with strobes, when you start to use strobes, and you get control over the light, you'll realize the difference between like a soft box and a beauty dish, between hard light and soft light, because you can learn it so much faster when you're actually controlling the light. You can then take those skills, and if you're taking a picture of somebody in natural light, you can use that to find the right light and to figure out exactly what angle that natural light should be, because it's so much easier to control with strobes. Same kind of thing with Photoshop. If you're a landscape photographer, and right now you say you don't Photoshop, well, maybe you start to experiment with Photoshop and uh, you realize, oh, you know, what this picture really needed was a, a focal point because you decide you're just going to Photoshop in a, a boat or a bird from one picture into another picture. And that would be a no-no for the way you personally publish work. But if you play with it in Photoshop, you can act out that scenario as if you'd had the patience to wait around for some birds to fly through the sky. So you're saying by limiting yourself, you might be keeping yourself from learning a valuable lesson. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you can always step back. You can go into Photoshop and then decide, I'm good at Photoshop now. I feel comfortable with it, but it's not going to be part of how I publish. But nonetheless, it will still be a learning experience. Have for you. you ever kept yourself from trying something new? Oh, for the longest time, I didn't, I didn't work with any artificial lights because I was mostly doing wildlife photography. So I just kind of like refuse to, to work with lights. And so I'm speaking from firsthand experience here, and it was a mistake. And then when I started doing portraits, I decided I was only going to do natural light portraits. And let's just say once I figured out how to use strobes, my natural light portraiture got better. Hmm. Firsthand experience. Um, the last big mistake I think people make is ignoring feedback. And I see this mistakes spread around like gospel all the time because people say, oh, you just got to ignore the haters. People are going to say negative things. You just got to ignore them. Yeah, I think the I think the trouble there is that we all have a bit of an ego, right? And we want to believe that everybody giving you critique is just a hater. So you have to learn where the valuable feedback might be coming from and not just think everybody's out to get you because they're giving you feedback. Having a, a group that you belong to is good for that because you're supporting one another a lot. So if someone gives you their input, you're going to trust that they're not just trying to bring you down or make you feel bad. It's important that you have someone that can do that for you. Tony does that for me. Um, a lot of the time I don't feel comfortable just asking strangers because I don't know them. So I don't know if I would trust their opinion anyway. So I'll ask people that I know that I trust that I know or have my best interest at heart. Um, but yeah, you've got to be able to take feedback to grow, definitely. I'll even say you'll get feedback that comes across really harsh. People can be rude. They might be jerks, yeah. but it doesn't mean they're jerks and they're wrong. Sometimes somebody who's a jerk and presents something harshly has at least a grain of truth in the feedback. And yeah. you can progress much faster if you can ignore the hostility that's contained in the criticism and actually find that kernel of truth and grow and learn from it. 
Now, on YouTube comments, people are jerks on a regular basis. And I always look at it and try to find the, the kernel of truth that's in it. Sometimes they'll be like, uh, you guys are idiots. Your sound is awful. My kid could make better sound. <laughs> And okay, they're being a jerk, but if I look at it, well, maybe we actually do need to make a change of the sound. Yeah, I'll hear you be like, Justin, was everything okay with the sound last week? And Justin would be like, yeah, that was great. <laughs> That's my Justin impression. Uh, someone on YouTube suggested you had a major stroke in the middle of the show and didn't hear stuff going on. Is that is that true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you can kind of tell then, too. I mean, if they just say you're awful and you suck and we kind of look into it. We're like, oh, yeah, okay. there's nothing you can learn from you're awful and you suck. Sometimes people will say, hey, guys, I think maybe you need to turn down your gain or something like that. And we look into it. If someone just says you're an idiot. That's not really constructive. So you've got to learn what's constructive. Um, if you're also, if you're defensive, people are going to stop helping you. So if every time one of your peers looks over and says, I like your shot, but you need to, uh, have you thought about lever leveling the horizon? If you say, well, what do you know? I've been shooting for longer than you. I meant to do, I meant to do that. If you're defensive, they're going to say, okay, I'm just not going to mess with that person again. That was pretty unpleasant. So you have to learn how to take the criticism in a way that people will want to help you. Yeah, even if they're less experienced than you. I happily accept criticism from people who don't have any photography experience. They still know how to look at a picture. Yeah. And if they like one picture better than the other and I don't agree, well, there's still something true about what they're telling me. Yeah, um, I actually, going back to my new friend Ira Block, who doesn't know that I want to be his friend. <laughs> I like love him so much. He he came over to me and showed me his pictures and he was like, this one or this one? What do you think? And I was like, oh, oh, me? Just me? Like, here's this person who has this established career that knows so much more than me, probably. But he's willing to get feedback from someone that's just not as established or respected. And I think there's a lesson in that. You can always learn something from everyone. Even if you're the best, there's going to be someone that can give you some advice or some input. So don't think that you're better than everyone. Yeah. It's Even if you've been shooting from the film days, you still don't know it all. Yeah. Thanks for listening uh, to the picture of this podcast. You can listen to it on any podcasting app. We appreciate reviews that you put in. Uh, if you have your own mistakes that you see people make, add a comment on the YouTube video down below. And thank you to our sponsor, Audible. You can go to audible.com slash photo to start a 30-day free trial. Get yourself free uh, audiobook. Listen to it on the go. Listen to it any opportunity you can. And you won't have an excuse to not read a book because you'll have it with you all the time. Thank you, can you for sponsoring Murakami. us. Maybe you can educate yourself better than me and learn what, is it Qbert? Learn what Qbert is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's basically an educational book. It's about time you learn the discipline of 1980s video What games. is Cubert by Chelsea Northrop? <laughs> okay, okay, thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye.